Hi, everyone, and welcome to the first Open Source Institute Colloquium of 2022. I'm Brendan, and I'm delighted we have philosopher and data scientist David Dank speaking to us today. But first, in this opening event, a few words to set the context. Topos is a nonprofit research institute now in its second year, and our mission is to shape technology for public benefit by advancing sciences of connection and integration. As part of this, we run this colloquium series to bring together a worldwide community around topics of critical importance to this mission. This year, we're focusing on four themes, ethical and societal impact of mathematics and computer science, foundation models, logic categories, and type theory, applied category theory, and of course, the tools and technologies that arise from these theories. I'm very, very excited for the lineup we have this year. You can find more details on the website. It's now an honor to pass to the chair of our board, Elise Khan, for some opening remarks. Thanks, Brenda. Thanks, everybody. I hope that my uh, voice is coming through uh, clearly. Um, perhaps not hoping that my image comes through clearly, but um, I'm equally excited by this uh, year. Thank you for giving me the opportunity of, um, of saying a couple of words. My first comment is to thank you and David and everybody at Topos for having the vision to get us off the ground a few years ago. You've said that this is our second year, but actually this has been a flame that has been tended and carefully nurtured for some time before that. I'm extremely proud of my connection and I'm extremely proud to be able to be of some service to what we're trying to do. Um, what I really wanted to um, share with you before we get started with David, and I'm looking forward very much to what David has to say, I wanted to supplement because, um, you know, Brendan, when you talked about the mission, about shaping technology for the public benefit, well, the subheading of the mission is actually a goal. Um, our goal is a world where the systems that surround us benefit all of us. And I'm involved um, very much in a quantum computing effort where many of the people who are involved are so besotted either by the pure science and why not a quantum computer when it's fully fault tolerant will be a benefit in many different areas, perhaps even in some of in answering some of the deepest of all scientific questions. But more and more people are getting more excited just about the potential uh, financial benefits. I can't blame them for that. But what I want to do is to make sure that we remind ourselves that we don't make the same mistakes that we've made in the past and more particularly in the mid-90s to the early 2000s, when I think that my generation was asleep at the wheel. And we did not talk about the kind of uh, risk that we are now living, the consequences of it. And so the Topos Institute is one which I think can lead this conversation in a way that is accountable, transparent, and consistent. I'm delighted that we can kick off the year with David, and I thank again, Brendan, you and David, you for allowing me these few words to remind us of why we do what we do. Thank you. No, I mean, thank you, Elias. Um, you've you've speak, spoken about the vision of the organization and you've been, been an incredible part of that, um, nurturing this also from the beginning. So it's a privilege to work with you too on this project. Now though, to our, our speaker. Um, as Ilias was just saying, one of the central questions we grapple with at Topos is what it means to be a fundamental science and technology research organization that is still truly laser focused on public benefit, on indeed building a world where the systems that surround us benefit us all. There's so much to explore in this question, particularly in a time like the present, as, as Ilias was just saying. Um, and uh, through thinking this through, both individually and as an organization, I've strongly appreciated the work of and conversations with our speaker today, Professor David Danks. And so with great anticipation, please join me in welcoming David, who will be talking to us today about ethics in AI, not ethics of AI. Uh, thank you so much, Brendan. Uh, it's it's uh, really a pleasure to be here um, in this virtual space. It's still, I'm not quite used to the idea that I can be in my office in San Diego and yet be, uh, be in everybody else's office and living room. Um, so it's a real pleasure to be here because I think the mission that you all have set forth at Topos is really 
uh, an inspiring one that cuts at, as Elias was saying, the heart of how we move forward. Um, doing both the basic foundational research, but recognizing the impacts that that has on the, the broader social uh, world in which we all live. And I think part of the challenge that we have is, of course, it can often be a long way from foundational research to, um, to uses and applications. And so that can, I think, lead people to think that perhaps ethics is not for them if they're doing the foundational work. And so what I want to do today is spend some time uh, hopefully disabusing you of that notion, if you have it, um, but also talking more specifically about what are some of the practices that we can actually use in our everyday lives as researchers and as developers. Um, so let me share some my slides here. Okay. Um, so, uh, so what I want to do is um, the, the word well, word, the, the acronym AI is in the title. Um, and, and I'm going to be talking a lot about AI in part because that's the world that I typically live in. Of course, as we all know, there is no such thing as AI. What there is is machine learning and computer vision and robotics and planning systems and all of these sorts of things. My own world is primarily the world of causal discovery and time series analysis in machine learning. Um, but more generally thinking about computational technologies is where the ethical work that I do tends to reside. I'm going to try to connect it in a few in various places with work that is perhaps more in the space of foundational pure mathematics. Um, but hopefully, you know, please, please bear with me if I if I fall back to talking a lot about AI, what I really mean is broad foundational computational, including in certain ways, mathematical research. So I think that there's a very common view um, that I, I don't know how many people on this, you know, here have this view, but certainly I find quite a lot, which is roughly the idea, well, AI, it's just math. Algorithms are just math. Math is just math. And what's meant by that is a kind of um, deflationary view about the impacts of, of what is being done, but also about the very nature of what is being done. It's a kind of, um, to put on my philosopher of math hat for the moment, it's a kind of formalist view about what occurs in computational disciplines and in mathematical and formal disciplines. It's the sort of idea that says, look, all I'm doing is moving the symbols around. And this is, uh, I will say, particularly, uh, particularly common, I find, in students uh, who have this view of, well, no, you know, it's, it's just math. It's just an algorithm. There's nothing ethical about it. Um, and so the idea then often is the only place that ethics matters on this common view is when we go to use the AI or the algorithms or the mathematics. Right? So the idea is that, sure, you can use math to you know, cause a lot of harm to people or to benefit people, but the math itself is not within the proper scope of ethics. The scope of ethics is all the uses that we make of these tools, right? It's a very tool kind of view. Um, there was a workshop last week on AI and earth sciences where somebody said, look, AI is just a whole bunch of tools. There's absolutely nothing substantive about AI. It's just tools. And so we don't think of you know, the ethics of a hammer normally, like that would sound weird. We talk about the ethical uses or unethical uses of it. So I think this common view has a lot of intuitive appeal. It fits with the way that we talk quite frequently. Um, I think that it leads to a very natural conception of ethics of AI in the sense of that ethics is about how we use and deploy the AI, the algorithms, the math. Okay. So I think this is a very common view, as you probably guessed from the title of the talk, ethics in AI, not ethics of AI. I'm going to try to argue against this. I'm going to try to suggest that this is not the right way um, to, to think about these kinds of formal uh, computational uh, research. Um, now, one thing to say before I move on that I should have said earlier, in talking with Brendan, um, because this is the first talk of the colloquium series, uh, there was a sort of uh, decision to have this be a bit more high level. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about specific cases, but um, I want to acknowledge right off the bat that from here on out, every single slide could be its own 45 minute talk. 
Okay, so if you're wondering what the details are, there's a lot more details behind everything I'm gonna do from here on out. Um, but, uh, you know, trying to cover a sort of wide scope uh, in, in order to just sort of set the stage in many ways. Okay, so what's the alternative use? When I talk about ethics in AI or ethics in mathematics, what do I mean by that? Well, the idea is that, um, in fact, there are ethical decisions that are occurring throughout research. Okay, not just in use. That is, uh, you know, AI is not just the ones and zeros in my machine. Math is not just math. Um, so, you know, it's not to say that formalism is necessarily wrong as a philosophy of math, but rather to say that there is more that goes into mathematical practice, mathematical research, even the most foundational, pure mathematical research. There's more going on than simply a sort of moving around of symbols. And so, you know, of course, I want to be clear, mathematical research is not all ethics. I'm not claiming that it's a matter of ethics, whether some proof is actually a proof, right? So if um, I provide, you know, some proof of the asymptotic reliability of an algorithm, I'm not claiming that that particular fact is an ethical matter necessarily. So the question then becomes, okay, so what do we mean or what do I mean when I'm talking here about ethics? Because you might be saying, well, wait a second, if it's, if it's not just about use, but it, it's also not whether a proof counts as, whether something that is a, a putative proof counts as a proof, that, that seems odd. Um, so what I mean by ethics is really what might be called a sort of big tent view. And that is that there's two core questions at the heart of, ethical considerations, ethical reasoning, ethical decision-making. One is what ought we value? Okay. The other is how ought we act given our values? Okay. So if you've heard of this sort of standard, what we call the normative ethical uh, theories, so consequentialism, deontology, virtue theory, you may have encountered these in an, say an engineering ethics course or something like that, um, or a philosophy course, those are in many ways largely attempts to answer the second question. Okay, so I'm not going to be saying, oh, you have to be a consequentialist or a deontologist. Um, instead, I want to focus on the part that's in bold there, namely our values. So it's not so much um, exactly what is the right answer to these questions that I want to pose uh, or that I want to explore, but rather the ways in which these questions are actually already showing up in our research. Okay. And in some sense, that, that shouldn't be that surprising. Um, you know, if you believe that this is the, if you accept uh, the sort of big tent view of ethics, then you're kind of led to this, you know, for all X, if X has value, then X involves ethics in some way, right? So the sort of pure formalist exercise might, I don't think it is, but one might hope that that could somehow reside outside of ethics. But to say that is actually, I wanna to suggest to, con to basically say, what I'm doing does not have particular values. It doesn't support anything. It doesn't make anything easier. It doesn't advance our knowledge in any way. And I assume most of us don't wanna say that about our own work, right? So I think what's going on is that we're already making ethical choices, everyone on this call. Okay. And so it's not about adding ethics onto our research efforts. It's about recognizing the ethical choices that we are already making, even in the most foundational research, so that we can, at least in theory, uh, make better choices as we're going along. So that's the notion of ethics in AI, it's, or ethics in mathematics. It's about taking a careful look at all the places that our values are playing a role in the choices and actions and plans and, in, and efforts that we have in our research projects so that we can make ones that are more defensible, better grounded in, in what we you know, want to pursue and all these kinds of things. Now, this is um, admittedly fairly abstract still. So let me now spend probably the next um, 20, 25 minutes going into some detail about what this different approach looks like. Right? So this is an approach that says, ethics is not a thing that gets added on at the end. It is not a thing that is purely about use or policy. 
It is rather something that is endemic to all of our research projects. And so we need to surface those ethical issues, engage with them openly, and find practices that help us do better. And so this is a very practice-centric kind of approach. Uh, I sometimes refer to this as translational ethics. It's like translational medicine is how do we go from basic biomedicine and, and make it useful in the world? This is a kind of translational ethics. How do we go from the, um, you know, the sort of, uh, work on the substantive moral virtues that, you know, I have colleagues here who work on, um, how do we go from that to actual practical guidance for those of us engaged in formal computational mathematical research? So to do this, I find it useful to think about sort of what I call the life cycle of a research project. Um, this is the particular way that, that I think about it. You can carve it up in different ways. One of the reasons I like about this is that it doesn't draw a distinction between research and development or research and creation. Um, it's just about how are we making progress. And, and I think the, in that sense, we could think about sort of five steps, well, really six, but I'm gonna focus on five, um, identifying a problem, right? What's the research question I'm trying to answer? Uh, figuring out what, what we would call in the uh, development world, uh, what we'd call the design stage. So what are the constraints? So if I'm trying to you know, identify, here's this mathematical puzzle, uh, how does this graph topology change as we perform certain kinds of operations on it? That one's top of mind right now for a, an algorithmic problem that we're trying to solve. Um, so I'm trying to look at, you know, given certain kinds of directed graphs, how, do those, how does the topology change when we can repeatedly apply op various operators to it? Well, the design constraints are, um, in this case, things about what you know, what, is, what are the other resources that are available to me? What counts as a successful solution? Uh, what is the standard that I'm gonna be, you know, having to fulfill in order to solve this? Um, you then have to do development. This is the part we normally think of as research. This is the, the you know, building the algorithm or actually coming up with the proof. Uh, the actual work that we have to do um, you know, this is sort of what gets the, the glory. It's the part where you're actually at the whiteboard, you know, trying to work your way through it. There's a kind of deployment stage if it's a technology or a connection phase if, uh, if you're doing more theoretical work where you say, okay, here's this result. How do I connect this into the network of what we already know? How do I make this part of, um, you know, where... Where are the communities that I wanna get this out to? Um, who should know about this? How do I frame this in a language that is to be understood okay, by the relevant communities? And then the use, right? We all hope that our theoretical work actually gets used somehow, somewhere, at least many of us do. Um, and so, you know, how does, th that's actually part of the research project. Now it might be reused or used, in another research project. I'm not claiming that use here has to be that it's you know, deployed on a smartphone somewhere, um, but this is an important step of, of even research projects is what happens once the result is done and out there in the world. And then of course, you, know, you refine, you revise, you improve, you build on, and that takes us back to all five, you know, take us back anywhere in this project. And that's the kind of iterative life cycle of research. So hopefully there's nothing terribly controversial here. Um, it's just trying to unpack that there's a lot more going on in a research project than just the part that I know I often focus on, which is the standing in front of the whiteboard trying to find that proof or writing the code or seeing the simulation results. There's a lot more to research than just that piece. Okay, And that's what I'm trying to do here is bring that to the fore because that's important if we want to think about where ethical, which is to say value relevant decisions are occurring throughout all of this. So let's do a deeper dive on, on at least the five that are around the outside. I'm not going to worry about the refined one because I think that, that that is a lot more context specific. But let's take a look at each of these other five uh, steps and, and see what kinds of ethical issues uh, arise. Now, this is especially going to be a case where every one of these slides I could do an entire talk on. So I'm gonna be trying to go kind of quickly. So I apologize in advance for that, but um, hopefully it's, it's helpful in how to think about where you are making value decisions in your own research efforts. So first let's think about identification, ideation. This is the sort of 
stage where you're trying to say, all right, what are we going to do next? Um, you know, a very familiar uh, step and where in many cases, at least in my own research, it's often driven by sort of just noticing a puzzle and thinking, huh, that, that's odd or that's interesting or that doesn't seem right. It seems like we should be able to connect these these two theories together, or we should be able to, to solve this particular problem that it looks like nobody has solved yet. But that means that what we're really doing is we're asking the question, what problems are worth the effort of trying to solve? And that, when I put it that way, hopefully you immediately look and go, oh, well, wait a second, that does look like an ethical question, or at least a question about values. Because that's to say that certain kinds of questions are more important than others. Now that's, maybe you wouldn't have thought of that as an ethical question. Like the, the idea that you think this particular question is more important than that one. You might say, well, wait a second, that's not ethics. That's just about, you know, what matters. And if you take away one message from today, that's, that's exactly what, how you should be thinking about ethics. Ethics is not about grand principles and theories. It's about understanding what matters and acting to advance what matters. So when we decide to tackle certain kinds of problems, we are making an ethical choice, a value choice about what is the most important way to proceed. And in fact, even if you think just the most pure formalist research that you want, you know, you think there's just, there's no way that this is about which problems are worth tackling or solving. Even there, at the very least, there's opportunity costs. All right, opportunity costs in the sense of, what, how you are spending your time or your team is spending their time or the paper you write that a journal reviewer is going to, to read and, and critique and, and make it, help make a decision on. There are these opportunity costs all over the place in research. We cannot research everything. And so the decision to put our research efforts behind one topic rather than another is signaling and implementing something about our values. <clears throat> now, obviously this, you know, the reason this slide could be an entire talk is in part because this is now very much, this, this particular stage gets very bound up in that, the first of those two ethical questions, which is what ought we value? And I don't necessarily wanna go down, and down that, that road right now, because I think that that's a much longer conversation. I think there is, though, there are things at this stage that are not having to, to have the sort of deep conversations of what matters to us personally, to us as researchers, to us as a research community, to us as citizens, right? We don't have to have that discussion um, to notice that there also are practical issues. Like, how do you even figure out if you might be making a choice that's not a great one? I mean, I suspect most of the folks here, myself included, we were never taught or trained how to identify that maybe we're going after a problem that isn't worth solving or how we might be doing something that actually could be misused or problematic down the road. And so you might wonder, well, even if I figured out, um, even if I might be doing some things where I'd like to get some guidance, where I'd like to talk to other people about, you know, is this really a problem we should be trying to solve right now? Um, I wouldn't even know how to recognize that this is one of those problems. And so, in fact, there's been a research effort. Um, you'll notice I was involved in this one. This was in, in the AI space um, in, in healthcare, but where we actually developed, you know, we called, this, we called it a data ethics checklist. What it really is, is a kind of, um, it's, it's a kind of sanity check, you could think of it that way, in the sense of if you have an idea for something that you wanna pursue on the research or the development side, how do you figure out whether this is something where you might want to talk to somebody because it might not actually support your values or your community's values? And this was, you know, again, call it a checklist, but it, it was really basically eight questions. You can do it in another, under five minutes. This was for particularly for data, uh, for data analytics, because that was the group we were working with. Um, but what we developed was a tool so that you could very quickly figure out, is this something where I should have more of a conversation with people? Now you can think about in, in the you know, mathematical case, the same kind of thing could come up. You know, is this a, a, a thing where if we figure this out, uh, it might be misused by people? 
or it might not actually contribute to the public benefit that Ilya referred to at the, at, at, at the start. Um, how would you answer that if you're trained as a pure mathematician? Well, the idea here is that we are developing a set of tools to enable people to figure out not what the answer is, but when should you pick up a phone and call somebody? And that's really important in practice to be able to recognize not necessarily what the answer is, but just to recognize this is one of those value questions that I'm not quite sure how to answer. So I'd really like to talk to somebody. Um, all right, so if we shift to the design phase, we then might one recognize that, you know, the very question of what are the relevant constraints is tied up in values. So if one of the things we say is we say, well, we can only do things that our funders are willing to support, that's an ethical choice. That's kind of an obviously an ethical choice. It's something that comes up all the time in research ethics is, uh, you know, where do we draw the line in terms of the influence of funding on the research efforts? Most people would say things like, it's okay for funders to help pick what the question is, but not the answer. But that's a value laden decision. That's an ethical decision. Or if we think, you know, we could do this, but the only way to do this would be to have access to all of these kinds of data that in fact would require us to do things that are problematic, shall we say? Um, then, uh, you know, when we talk about networks, we're often talking about information over large numbers of individuals. Well, that's a value question to ask what constraints we're going to place on ourselves. And notice that in a lot of these cases, many of these things, time funding, data requirements, there might not be any technical constraint here, right? The, the formalism might not say, I mean, formalisms don't tell us how much time we have available or how much time we can spend on things. Formalisms don't tell us uh, what data we can and cannot have access to. Formalisms don't tell us what information we might be able to get access to. So these, these are not questions that mathematics is going to be able to answer for us. Right? And that's maybe another way to think about, particularly in these first two stages, what are the things that come up, whether in AI or mathematics, that sort of the technology or the formalism doesn't care, as it were. It, it, we can use it either way. Well, that means that we must be making our decisions based on other things. So, um, and this gets particularly tricky because of course, different people might have different values or constraints. We have what we would refer to in philosophy as value pluralism here. So, you know, how do we collectively decide what things are worth pursuing? Now, right now in many research communities, uh, the way we collectively decide is prestige. Uh, we listen to big names, we look at what seems to be popular, and we do lots of things that, again, are not necessarily driven by the formalism itself, but rather are driven by other factors. And this is, I think, a nice example of the sense in which we are already making ethical decisions. We are already using certain values to make these decisions. We're just not being explicit about it, and we might not be using the values that we think we should. And so, in fact, there's an entire field that is now emerging of what's called value-sensitive design or community-sensitive design, um, community-centered design, all these sorts of things. Um, it is, you know, this particular book by Friedman and Hendry was, you know, focused on technology, but actually the general methodologies in value-sensitive design apply to almost any research effort. They're much more broadly about projects. And it's about figuring out what do we think are the constraints that matter? What does it mean to have success in our community? Where of course, not everybody's views count equally, right? I am not somehow suggesting that when you all at Topos are trying to decide your next research project, that you wander down onto the streets of Berkeley onto Telegraph and you ask the first 10 people you see and have them vote in a poll. That's not what this is about, right? It's not saying that you just sort of randomly poll people. This isn't like direct democracy about what research we do. I think that would be a very bad idea because it is unlikely to support the relevant values. But it is the case that we can use these kinds of, of techniques to make more ethically informed decisions both at the identification and at the design phases of our research projects. Now, now we get to the develop stage. This is the standing at the whiteboard phase. Um, here, I think, you know, 
the obvious place that ethical considerations enter is what counts as a good solution. And I think that this is perhaps really easy to see in some sense in actually mathematics. It's one of the easiest ways to see where additional values are coming in because in some sense, you know, there's a sort of well-known uh, observation that a lot of people have made that there's something strange about the fact, or there's something that seems to be a bit strange about the fact that, for example, in mathematics, people will give additional proofs of known theorems, right? I mean, if all we're doing is sort of just math, then that seems very odd. Why would we bother to give a second proof of something that's already known? But of course, as we all know, that's because the second proof might be simpler or give us more depth or generalize to a wider space, right? It's a proof technique that we can then apply in many different places. And so in general, what this points to is the fact that especially actually in sort of pure mathematics, what counts as a solution, a good solution to our research question is not simply a technical matter. Okay? We're not just relying on, well, the formalism says it holds, therefore we're done. We actually try to find better methods. We try to find better techniques. Right. Um, you know, we see this actually right now quite frequently in machine learning about what counts as a good solution. Uh, if I have a black box algorithm that gets a certain level of predictive accuracy that is better than what, an, say, an explainable algorithm would give me, which one's better? And notice that the better here, you know, it's we've got different dimensions that we care about. And when I say care about, what I mean is we've got different dimensions that we value. So this is at heart an ethical issue. It's about, you know, when we say, look, I really care about simple proofs, or I really care about proofs that give me techniques that I can use in, for other problems. Those two values can lead us to prioritize different uh, paths in the research effort. And they are different values. They're not different values in the sense of, you know, uh, the way we sometimes think about ethical values, like privacy versus security but they are nonetheless values that matter to us and that are shaped by the communities in which we find ourselves. So it is, I wanna suggest ethical, even when you're standing at the whiteboard saying, yeah, I mean, I guess that that's a proof, but I really just don't like it, or that's not satisfying. What you're doing is you're actually doing ethics. You may not have realized that, but you are, because what you're doing is you're expressing a value and saying this particular path of the research effort is not supporting those values. It's not the kind of classic ethical harms and ethical benefits, right? I mean, we're not talking here about, um, well, if I use this algorithm that's, you know, accurate versus that algorithm that's unbiased, you know, if I use the accurate but biased one, uh, it may be that, you know, communities of color are being denied access to resources, right? That's the kind of thing that comes up, say, in the algorithmic bias literature. That's where um, people think about the sort of very tangible ethical harms, and this isn't necessarily of that sort. And so I think it's, you know, not perhaps surprising that we don't often notice that we are bringing in values in this stage of the research effort. Nonetheless, I think we are, and we would benefit from being more explicit about what it is that we are taking to be a good solution. Um, certainly in the communities in ML, and uh, you know various parts of graph theory that I work in. Um, it's not category theory uh, or you know topos theory, but um, a lot of there's a kind of understanding of what counts as a good solution, but people are rarely explicit about it. And so I want to encourage that at the very least we should start to be more explicit in our research efforts about you know look here's the kind of solution I'm trying to find. I'm not just trying to find a theorem trying to find a theorem that has these additional properties, because I think that those matter. Well, why do those matter? Well, now we have to start articulating, right? We can't just say, well, because, you know, I like simple things, right? Well, I mean, I, I could say that, but that's probably not a very satisfying answer. So we need to think about what really matters to us as a community, which is to say this connects immediately back to the previous slide, right? So those techniques about value-centered design are not just about how do we know what the design constraints are? They're also what counts as a good solution. So how do we move towards that as a community? 
Um, and I would just suggest, at least based on some conversations with Brendan, it sounds like this sort of thing is already happening at Topos. Like, what are the kinds of problems we want to do? What are the kinds of things that matter to us? What are the kinds of questions that we want to ask? What are the good solutions? What counts as actually solving or making progress on a problem, even when it doesn't connect to a real world case? So I think that it's good to see that Topos is already starting these conversations. Um, if you take the lesson, you know, if you get a, le a lesson from the last few slides, hopefully it's that there actually are very practical tools that are already out there and have been developed that you can use to try to improve those conversations and do things in a more intentional way. Okay. Now, um, you might be thinking, okay, all right, I, I get this, maybe you've been convinced so far, um, but you know, once the research is done, now we're in the world of it's about use and policy. And before, you know, and, and development and and, uh, and getting it out in the world, right? Now we're in the, it's unethical because of how I use it. But actually, I don't think that we're there just yet, because the question of how we ensure that others understand our research, our algorithms, our technology, I think that that's actually an ethical obligation that we all have to try to help others understand our research. I don't think that our um, obligations are done once we have the theorem and we throw it out into the world. I think we do have an obligation to try and help people understand what we're doing. This is particularly acute in AI and computational technologies because there's a lot of people building a lot of algorithms that are then horribly misused or building new models that are horribly misused. Not because the person using the, the method or the theorem or the algorithm, it's not because that person is you know, a bad person. They're not doing it maliciously. They're misusing because they don't understand. Okay? And I think that both sides bear some obligation when we consistently are seeing failures of understanding. So, you know, you might say, all right, okay, how do we do this? Well, we give talks, right? That's something that, that we all do. We give talks to try to help the audiences understand what it is that our research does and does not show. Um, we write journal papers and hopefully those are good, but these are actually not terribly scalable. Um, you know, in a time of Zoom, things get a little bit more scalable in terms of talks, but there's a real challenge of how do we get the word out in appropriate ways, especially because a lot of foundational research is picked up by a random startup company, is picked up by a part of a company that is just trying to make money and they're not, they're not worried about some of the things that you might have worried about. How do you help make sure that others can actually understand your research when they go to use it. Even if you're not gonna be the one to translate it to practice, others might. And I think you do have an obligation, we all have obligations, um, to try to help others understand what it is we've done. And in fact, there are methods being developed. So this is what I'm showing down here. This is what's called a model card. These come out of Google, but there are similar other ideas that are out there. Um, and you know, model cards, the idea is that what they do is they enable people to, you can think of this as sort of the metadata about a model. It says, you know, here's where it's likely to work. Here's what we did to train it. Here is the usability uh, conditions for it. Here's the semantic content of the output, right? Now this is a model, it's not necessarily a theorem, um, but nonetheless, what this points towards is that there are structured ways to be able to make sure we're transmitting information appropriately. You can sort of think of this particular thing as it's sort of like commenting your code, except it's not about code, it's about ideas, right? And how do we provide the commentary on our own ideas such that people understand them and are not misusing them, mis, uh, misappropriating them? Again, we can't stop every misunderstanding, um, but I think that we do have an obligation to at least try. And so then we finally get to the, you know, the use part. This is the, the sort of most obvious one, right? How do we make sure that ideas are not being misused? Um, again, I think that we can't prevent everything, but we do have an obligation to not make it easy to misuse the, the materials that we're producing. Um, this particularly comes up with things having to do with open source software and open source uh, technologies. Um, you can open source in ways that make it easy to misuse or to use in ethically problematic ways. You can open source uh, so that it doesn't end up being that way. 
Um, and I think that we have an obligation to, uh, to take steps. So if, for example, folks at Topos are building open source software, I think there's an obligation to at least think about the ways that this could be misused and to try to put in uh, some of those, some of those uh, uh, checks or other, other ways of putting in friction. I mean, look, people are bound and determined, they'll find ways to misuse, I acknowledge that. Uh, but that doesn't mean that, that we are free of an obligation to try and shape things. So, I mean, you might wonder among many practical questions here, uh, how could we ever know about misuse? And this is where we're actually seeing a, a rise of, of both companies or nonprofits like For Humanity, but also wider efforts trying very hard to develop systems to audit, for example, algorithms. More and more generally audit the uses of technology, uh, the uses of formal systems. So I think you know one one question that that one might ask that you all might ask is you know if you're going to open source things, um, do you want to open source with a an audit tool so that the users of the open source can sort of ask themselves, are we using this correctly? Are we using this appropriately? Are we using it ethically? All right. So so that was um, an attempt to sort of give you a feel for the some of the different ways that ethical questions arise in research not only at the end, uh, and some of the tools that people are starting to develop. Now, you might be saying, wait a second, all right, I'm, you, you, know, you might just sort of be confused. Like, I thought ethics was supposed to be about universals, right? Isn't that what ethics is? It's about, you know, is it, you know, if I, if my, my wife is sick and I can't afford the medicine, is it ethical for me to steal the medicine that, you know, I'm breaking one principle, but it's in service of another? You might be thinking that way. And in fact, that's what we're seeing certainly in the AI space right now. So, you know, pretty much every company now is coming up with sets of principles, right? Um, the University of California now has a set of responsible AI principles. Uh, these came out in October, I think, just recently. Um, and now I'll just note, well, I'll come back to this, sorry. Um, so the University of California has it, many different organizations do. The federal government has uh, ethical, AI, trustworthy AI principles. So you're already noticing we've got ethical, responsible, trustworthy, maybe these aren't about the same thing. Um, so these, there's just a proliferation of principles, right? Um, the last time I checked, there were nearly 200 sets of principles that were out there. And I'm sure the number has grown in the last 30 minutes. Um, it's gotten to the point, we now even have articles that give the principles four sets of principles, right? That attempt to take all these sets of principles and say, what are the principles that underlie the sets of principles? So it's sort of all over the place. And you might be wondering, you might be sort of surprised that we've gotten this far in a talk about ethics, and about AI, and I haven't, you know, this is the first time I'm mentioning anything having to do with ethical principles. Like, isn't that where we should start? We start with Topo saying, okay, what are our ethical principles? What are the principles that will guide us? And there's a reason that I haven't talked about principles. And that's because while I think that they are, they can have value, I think that principles have, um, have become far too emphasized as we're trying to be more ethical in these professional domains. And I think the problem is really twofold. The first is that principles, actually, basically none of these principles imply concrete, tangible actions. Um, I you regularly give my students uh, an assignment where I say, okay, pick Google or up until about a year ago, Microsoft or you know, any others, pick their ethical principles go through and explain what you would do differently as an engineer, as an employee of the company, now that this principle is in, now that these principles are in place. And the students actually hate the assignment because it's really hard to figure out what you would do differently just because you're told that um, the technology, say that you build, the AI that you build should be empowering. What am I supposed to do? Or, you know, one of the US government's principles is that AI should be governable. And they give you a few words about what that kind of means. But if you are on the ground floor actually building these systems, or you are in acquisitions trying to decide whether to purchase one of these systems, what does this mean? And so we're going to have to do the practices anyway. We have to get down to the level of, practic of, of actual practice and process. And so it's not always clear exactly what work is being done by the principles, right? We might like having them. They might help guide us 
towards practices. That's what's happening, for example, at the University of California strategy. Uh, the UC, they've adopted these principles, and now there is an entire standing working group who's charged with, okay, how do you convert principles into practices? And so they spent two years coming up with the principles, and now we're gonna have to spend another two years coming up with the practices. So there's something to be said in my book for just making sure you're thinking about practices from the beginning. So it's not that I'm opposed to principles here, it's that I don't think that they get us very far and they consume a lot of time and energy. So I think it's important to think if you're going to think about principles, also think about practices alongside. Now, the other problem I have with principles, or I worry about principles, is that they are basically always framed as this thing that is added on to what was already occurring, right? So we were already doing our tech development, ah, but now we're going to bring in these principles. And as you might guess from the previous uh, slides and, and part of this talk, I think that that's just the wrong way to think about it. We already had ethics that were going on. We were already making value decisions all along. They were just unprincipled ones, right? So it isn't that we're adding something on, it's that we're trying to fix what was already present. Okay. And so principles invite this framing that what we're doing is we're thinking about it as um, there's AI and then there's ethical or responsible AI. Like that's the good kind where, you know, you get the gold star or something like this. And I think that's, that's just a mistake because AI is already an ethical effort. I'll come to math in just a second, but AI is, you know, this is the world I live in. It's already something that is subject to the demands of ethics. So we're already making ethical decisions. It's not an add-on that comes after the fact. And so the proper frame, I think, is that we shouldn't be talking about AI as you know, the ordinary thing and then there's the ethical stuff. No, no, there's AI and then there's the unethically done. There's the stuff that is done in ignorance, the stuff that is done without intent or consideration. And so what I think we need to do is we need to shift the way that we are thinking about ethics in these domains away from principles that it's nice when you have them to recognize, to recognizing that things like articulating what counts as a good solution is as much about being, it's as much of a part of being skilled at AI as it is, you know, that you have to use appropriate learning methods. And right? if I have data that's approximately linear and I fit it with a quadratic, I'm just bad at my job, right? It isn't that I'm unethical, I'm, I'm just bad. Right? It isn't like I could fit it with a quadratic and that's doing AI. And then there's the good skill that, no, you're just bad. And I think we need to find ways to shift our cultural norms, to recognize that those who are doing things without consideration of values and without consideration of ethics are just bad at their jobs. Now, I know that's a very strong way to put it, but I think that that is an important mental shift, is shifting away from thinking that ethical, responsible AI is this it's this bonus good thing. And instead shifting to thinking that the unethically done stuff is somebody being unskilled, just in the way that we recognize people as being unskilled in their use of technical systems or, or formal machinery. And I think actually the exact same thing holds for math. Okay. Um, I think that we need to not think about it as like there's math and then there's math for the public good. Sorry, I know that this is the way the Topos mission statement is written, but I think that what, in some, and I think I understand there's good reasons to do that, but I think, you know, my, my utopian goal would be that we could start to see a cultural shift in the social norms amongst us as researchers to instead thinking about it as no, you're doing formal research. And then there's those people who are just doing it badly. Right? Just like we would say, oh, yeah, they're trying to prove things with that technique. That's, you know, oh, they're trying to use forcing for that. Oh, that's never going to work. That's just entirely inappropriate, right? Those kinds of judgments that we all already make, but we make on more technical grounds, I think we need to start recognizing them in more ethical grounds. Okay. So I'll just very briefly sum up, and then I think we have about 10 minutes for questions if people have any. Um, I know I've covered a whole lot. Uh, but what I'm really just trying to do is to get people to think, you know, I, I mean, part of this is as a sort of framing talk. I took seriously Brendan's invitation to think about it that way, which is 
to really try and, and open the aperture, get you thinking about all of the different ways that actually, even in fundamental, foundational, pure research, we're really making value decisions. They're not value decisions about, you know, do we help this community or do we help that community? I reckon, you know, they're not of that sort, but they are nonetheless value decisions. And so we need to think seriously about those value decisions. We need to not just make them because, well, you know, sounds good to me, which is the way I myself have a history of having made decisions like so. I don't want to, I'm not blaming anybody for this, but I think that we need to be more intentional in, in how we structure these things. They may never show up in a journal article, but nonetheless, there are tools that exist to help us do a better job and to be able to start to shift to seeing that in all of these areas, sort of across many areas in STEM, it isn't about the ethics of it, where we sort of apply ethical things only at the very end, but rather recognizing that part of being skilled or good at mathematics, at AI, at um, at engineering, part of being skilled at that is recognizing the ways that values play a role and being able to intelligently make decisions about how those values should or could influence the research that we're doing. So with that, I will say thanks uh, and would welcome a chance to, to talk a little further. Um, you want me to answer, handle questions? I'm happy to do them, Brendan, or you can, whatever would be easier. Um, why don't, if you're happy to do it, I'll let you go for it. Uh, thank you. Okay, great. Uh, Moshe, I'm not surprised that you've got a question. <laughs> so the title of your talk was Ethics in AI, not Ethics of AI. Mm -hmm. But the talk that I heard you give was Ethics in AI R&D, or in fact, Ethics in Research and Development. That's, is that what you mean? It was about the R&D process. You said in, when you're doing business development, there are ethical principles, there, you should, there are ethical dimension to doing R&D. And in some sense, it's nothing to do with AI. It could, it could be applied to, to any type of research and scholarship. In fact, I would say is, you know, way, way back, 20 years ago, my wife and I used to go to restaurants and we would discuss Chinese or Mexican. And we can now make a say, we have to make a choice. It should be based on values. What are the ethical dimension of going eating Chinese or eating Mexican? Yeah, so um, so I, 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 didn't, uh, I didn't say this at the outset, um, but uh, you, you've, you've highlighted that um, or picked up on that. So an earlier version of this talk um, was AI specific. And it really do dug down into the very specific things having to do with AI and um, not just in the R&D process, but in the technologies that result from uh, those research efforts. So when we actually produce various kinds of, whether they are disembodied or embodied artifacts, um, how are values actually literally implemented in those things? Um, not just a, a considerations that apply to them from the outside. So you can think of this as sort of, how does a hammer literally implement certain kinds of ethical values? Um, and so what I was doing here um, was trying to broaden. Um, and, and what you are pointing out is it may be that what I've done is, is broadened too far, uh, but I did wanna you know, try to bring in the fact that I, I know a lot of the work at Topos is not, not necessarily the kind of you know, traditional AI work that I typically study and do myself. So um, yeah, there's a risk that I've, that I've pushed it too far. And some of the things that I'm saying, uh, no, you know, are sort of trivial as a result. But I do think that, um, I mean, I do think that in general research and, you know, the research effort does have values throughout it and we need to be a lot more intentional. I, I completely agree. I completely agree. But, you know, in fact, maybe we should talk more about ethical values and about values that are implicit when we do R&D. And we typically don't. And I, I applaud you for saying we should. But, I, I it's not, it's to me, but it's not about AI, that's my point. It's about R&D, so to speak. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, th that's what this one much more was. Um, 
And I want to acknowledge sort of David's point that I pushed the talk in that direction. <laughs> um, and, you know, I really, well, I, I think. This yeah, but then I, but then I didn't want to change the discussion. title. I didn't mm -hmm. want to change the title, so I bear. We, we, it, it was a it was an interaction that happened. Uh, Paulo, uh, I'm not hearing you, Paulo. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. Sorry. Uh, yeah. No. Thank you very much for the talk. I really appreciated it, and I agree with almost everything. One question. There are some situations where being ethical, uh, so to say, if I were to pay attention to the ethical side and act accordingly, there's either nothing in it for me or it's even worse for me. Maybe an oversimplified example is if I don't explain very well how my code works, then the people that use it are going to need me again. And it's maybe this is not the best example, but I'm sure you can think of a better one. So how do we make sure that or at least how could we help uh, to make people actually adopt, adopt this and keep adopting this a little bit more spontaneously? Like how do we make the shift, so to say, happen? Or how could we make the shift happen in such a way that they don't revert back to their old ways? Yeah, so, um, so what you're highlighting there is, is a big reason why um, you know, it, it, that underlies, at least in terms of motivation, a lot of the things that I was talking about in my own and a lot of my own research. So the effort on um, on what we call, you know, the, the data ethics checklist, what I think of as ethical triage, um, you know, one of the constraints that we imposed at the very beginning of that project that I insisted on is whatever we produced, you had to be able to do it in under five minutes. And you had to be able to learn to use the tool in under 15 minutes of training. Uh, because right now, if you want to think about the impacts of your research, you'll, if you go on the web, you'll often find things that are here, do this two week long effort. And that's not going to happen. I mean, that, that's just the reality of, of people's lives. And so even if you do it once, it's not going to become part of regular practice. So I think one thing that's important is that we need to find ways to integrate these kinds of considerations simply into the everyday flow of our practices. It's, it's actually the lesson that people learned 40 years ago in terms of commenting code. If you don't comment as you go, if that's not just part of what writing code is for you, it doesn't happen. Um, it's actually what is still being learned right now about security and privacy, which is if you're not thinking about them in the moment, you will, you, you, you'll think, oh, I'll add it at the end and you never will. And so, so that's where I think, you know, yet another reason to emphasize practice is how do we simply get this to be part of what you just do in your everyday job? Uh, in your everyday research life, you know, and, and I try and do this myself. I try to, you know, as it were, um, uh, uh, eat, eat, the, eat my own corn or my own dog food, as the saying is in Silicon Valley, right, is, you know, how do I make sure that every time I'm working on a research project, we're, we're explicitly going through, okay, let's articulate. What are the things that count as a good solution? What are we trying to achieve? What are the other questions that we might have asked? And we've gotten to where, you know, you can do this in 10 minutes. It, it, it isn't actually burdensome, but it does have to become a habit. And I think that that's where the broader organizational culture plays an enormous role, right? I'm a professor. I can just say to my students and my, my collaborators, we're doing this, I don't care. Um, that, you know, that's not somebody that a Google engineer can do. And so I do think that there's real questions and issues of how do we change? That's why I was emphasizing at the end this talk of changing cultures and changing the social norms, because I think that has an enormous role. Thank uh, you. Uh, David? Yeah, hi. Um, thanks for the talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, so what I understood uh, was basically, and I, it, I think I'm understanding that like, from your point of view, we should be thinking up front about the values that are, are, um, are guiding our research. And then I think I heard Paolo say like, what if someone thinks like, this is going to make me a worse, you know, be a burden? Uh, how can, but my feeling, and I want to see if you agree, this is part one of the question is like uh, that thinking about your values up front or what it is you're really up to um, makes the research more usable that and, and more more widely like kind of interesting or something like that so that it's not really a burden it's actually it's not just painful it's actually good but then my second kind of follow-up is if i'm thinking about my own values up front is there more to do 
than like what I'm using to value this. You mentioned in the beginning uh, the word defensible. And so I was kind of wondering like uh, defensible to who or what maybe what role anything besides my own values that are governing this are playing. Yeah, um, so, so I agree with you that, um, that there is not a, there's actually not a tension between ethical and effective um, that, that in fact, if you want to have more effective research that makes, uh, you know, is more connected in um, and more impactful, then frequently that, that means asking these kinds of questions. So I certainly am, am in favor of that, um, that framing. I, I think in the corporate setting, there's still not, it's not clear yet, you know, if I'm a three-person startup, Am I really going to stop and ask some of these things? Um, it's good in the long run, but unfortunately, I think there still is very much a culture of, um, yeah, that'd be good, but we don't have time for that. Um, and I think that's short-sighted, but you know, that, not not my startup. Um, so it's hard to hard to say anything. Now, the question you ask though about sort of defensible to whom, and how do we make this sort of more structured? I, I see those as actually two parts of the same uh, same issue, which is as we introduce these sorts of practice and process changes, um, these sorts of you know, structures within our practice and processes to ask these questions, um, that's one of the things that, that actually does need to be addressed is who are you trying to, you know, whose values matter? What is the community to which you're speaking? What are your obligations? So that, that is a place where I think we still need to have people be willing to take some time at the outset. Now, the advantage of it is it's not something that has to happen every time. So if you think about what is the community that we are trying to speak to, the community we're trying to engage with, that's a kind of upfront investment of, yeah, probably five to 10 hours worth of, of effort that then can shape the practices, the practices that you put into place so that you know how to do them in, in an appropriate way. Um, but it does raise a question. I mean, are you trying to speak to or make a difference in, you know, so when Topo says public benefit, who's the public? I, mean, I think that's a question that you all need to, to address. I don't think there's a, a right or wrong answer there. I think what's important is that you're on the same page and that people are, I mean, I think there, there could be wrong answers, right? If the public is uh, only people who look like you uh, or me, then I'm not okay with that. You know, I think there's, a, there's ethical problems with that answer. Um, but there's a lot of, you know, is it the US? Is it the West? Is it California? Is it the globe? Is it people with access to technologies and large social systems or you know, like um, that, I think there is real value in doing upfront effort to get clear on because then that can inform and guide the later practices. Great, thanks. Um, there's somebody in the Juliet room, but I'm guessing that that's Dana. Yes, yes, can you hear me? Yes, thank you, Dana. Okay, thanks for the talk, very nice. I have two comments, first about Communication. You mentioned research journals, which are inappropriate for the kind of communication you were hoping for. <clears throat> but there's the New Scientist, the Scientific American, the many online journals. The AMS has journal for general reading, uh, and the communications of the ACM is excellent. Uh, Moshe is always writing articles for the communication. So there are many places where you could have a more general discussion. Maybe someone should write an article about how to write an article so that uh, you can reach uh, an audience and have, just like today, have a general discussion among people from different areas. Second thing is you touched very lightly on oversight. That, that's, of course, uh, two or three other lectures about appropriate oversight. However, I want to raise the question about legal things. We have laws against poison, against dangerous drugs, against guns, against driving. Uh, of course, uh, as the Sandy Hook, uh, Hook uh, parents know, it takes a decade to even get minimal re redress against bad behavior. However, shouldn't we be thinking about making laws in connection to the use of algorithms? I'm thinking that an algorithm is working away in the dead of noon behind closed computers 
using languages that no one can understand, taking account of data that no one can check through. And then all of a sudden, it turns out I'm a non-person. Everything has been taken away from me. Maybe the algorithm was hacked. Maybe the algorithm was bad in the first place. But if there's no redress, then suicide is the only solution for me if I'm the victim of algorithmic misuse. So how do we start thinking about legal redress? That's my question. Yeah, so um, as you said, that, that's another two or three, uh, two or three lectures. Uh, I could pull up the slides on my dynamic certification lecture, but I'm guessing people don't want that. Um, and so, so part of the reason I didn't talk about it today though is, is I, I am actually a very big believer in academic freedom and, and in certain kinds of research freedom. Um, I, I have a lot of nervousness about legal regulation of research efforts. Uh, it's not that I think that there's a bright line that can be drawn between research and deployment. I recognize that there's not, and I recognize that there's a lot of fuzzy gray cases. But I also don't want um, the federal government, for example, uh, getting in the business of explicitly regulating what kinds of questions say we as academics are permitted to ask. Um, and so uh, that was part of the reason is that I was trying to focus here on the research effort in a lot of ways. Um, I completely agree with you. Uh, we need to have clarity about, um, about redress. We need to have clarity about certification. We need to have clarity about when it is permissible to use certain kinds of algorithms. We're seeing this, th this start to happen. Um, so there is, there are some regulations in, um, in New York uh, that are coming online that are going to make it, that might make a difference. Um, there's been a call for an AI Bill of Rights that the OSTP and the White House is, is running that effort. Um, we'll see how well it works, but it's happened, you know, it's starting. Um, in fact, in, in our former uh, hometown, Dana, of Pittsburgh, there is uh, a task force that is wrapping up its work on the use of algorithms in public life. And so when should the city and county be willing to, uh, or be able to use algorithms to make decisions about access to resources? So I think we're starting to see a movement here. What I worry about is that a lot of these efforts feel like they're coming much too late uh, unfortunately, I think a lot of this, uh, the harms have already been done and we already have the monopolies that are able to exert a lot of power and do a lot of harm. Um, they were able to grow to the sizes they are because of lack of regulation and now it's too late to regulate. So I, I, I agree with you. I think it's a hard road and I will say my time I spend in DC, uh, people are not very interested in hearing some of this. And um, it's a very frustrating time to try to make the case that, in fact, everybody would be better off, including the companies, if we introduced intelligent regulation. Uh, Valeria. Just quickly before these questions, um, two hands, Valeria and Michael's hand have been up for a while. I'm gonna suggest we, we take those two questions and then uh, we'll shut off the live stream and recording and move to more free form discussion. If that okay. Uh, Sounds good. I'm uh, pending your availability, David. Yeah, I, I've, I, I have to. I have to meet with a student uh, in four in fifty one minutes, so I've got plenty of time. And as you can tell, I love talking about this stuff in, in these discussions. So happy to stick around, uh, Valeria. Yes. So hi, David. Thanks very much. Very thought provoking. Um, having all this conversation, I particularly like the bit about um, uh, practices, not principles, because I think principles is is really a way to whitewash things kind of in lots of ways and and um, you know I think you're right that this business of regulation is very and that Dana mentioned is very important and uh, lots more of conversations need to happen about that but the business that I really wanted to ask you is about this uh, is what you're saying about sets of principles that you think exist already that um, that that you know I find it hard to believe that that principles, sorry, not principles, uh, practices and 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 methods to to deal with the questions, and 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 you know I I think, in particular, I would like to hear a little bit more on at least a reference to what we mean by safeguarding open source 
um, software because, um, you know, I, as I say, I do not believe that eight questions will solve any of these issues. I, you know, so kind of there must be something deeper that you mean by practices there. And I want to at least hear a little vignette of what they are. Sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, and just to be clear, um, the the eight questions, that's that's to figure out when is it important to have a deeper conversation. And so then there's the whole other set of slides of, okay, what does that deeper conversation look like? But it's recognizing that, you know, in the context of that group, that there's a difference between doing data analytics on server load to balance server utilization and doing data analytics to produce a face recognition system that will be deployed on all of the cameras across the hospital. Like these are not the same and they should not get the same level of inquiry. So how do we very quickly and intelligently figure out that one we wanna talk about this one, we're good, just go build it. Um, and so that's, uh, so, so yeah, so there's a whole other, you know, I was trying to just give a kind of sampler platter of some of these things. Um, now your question um, about safeguarding open source software. Um, so, so let me give a, a kind of very practical example that isn't, it isn't exactly open source, but so I'll bring it back to open source, I promise. But so here's, here's something that, that has happened with multiple um, systems that have been developed for face recognition. They are, systems are developed for facial recognition. Uh, they are handed off to, let's say, law enforcement. And there've been notable cases where what's happened is that basically law enforcement has done the following. This is the most famous of the cases. Um, there was uh, security footage of a, um, of a robbery. Uh, it was not good enough to run face recognition on it. They talked to an eyewitness who said, yeah, the person sort of looked like Woody Harrelson. And so the police officers went on Google image search, cut out you know, a picture of Woody Harrelson, pasted it into the security footage over the face of the robber, ran it through the face recognition system again. Now, Woody Harrelson was not in their database of, of prior offenders, but it did return a hit and they went and then pursued that lead um, and ultimately it looks like that person did commit the crime but still that clearly is not how this system should have been used right the, you don't use face recognition by saying well somebody said it looked like that person so i'll take a different picture throw it in there and sort of just see what happens um and i think in general when we develop software you know when you develop open, so open source software most people do not change what they find in open source software Open source software, by and large, people use it as it is written. It is used as a way to, you know, sort of scaffold a much bigger project, which, you know, can lead to everything from a massive security vulnerability that affects millions, uh, if it's a logging software that was open source, to an open source thing that it looks like there are over 100 scientific papers that are going to have to be in some sense withdrawn because their results depended upon a Python package that had numerical errors in it. Um, and so, you know, people don't actually, even though open source, you can go and look, people don't. And so the question then becomes, okay, well, what API are you giving people? Are you giving them an API that makes it easy to do things that you think would be unethical? Uh, you know, the, the face recognition software folks could have easily had just a very fast check. Has this, uh, has the image been significantly modified, right? That there's open source software for that. And you just drop it in and you know, you could just say, we will not run if you have done significant editing to the, to the image. Just won't run. It's still open source. It's still going to work for all of the ethical uses, presumably, but you can't misuse. And so the question then becomes, the challenge becomes, and here I would point to techniques that I don't like the term, but they often fall under the heady of what's called futuring. But it's essentially where you try and imagine, you can also think of it as a kind of red teaming, if you've heard of that phrase where you imagine how could people misuse what we're building? And then you say, all right, how do we build the API to, to introduce friction? You can't stop it because of course they could just open it up that's, you know, and, and do it. But the reality is we know that people don't open it up, right? So in some sense, it's, it's, um, it is kind of paternalistic because we're taking advantage of the fact that we know people are, whether you wanna call it lazy or efficient, I'll let you decide, but we know that people are not gonna look at the details. They're going to follow the path of least resistance. So how do we give them a path of least resistance that leads them to the ethical uses? 
So that's the notion. Um, now, it's also things like, how do you protect your code base so that you don't have people adding, as was happening with Linux, where they added vulnerabilities into the Linux co uh, kernel. And these, I mean, there's that kind of safeguarding and security also. But what I'm talking about is, how do we use what we know people will do with this to guide them towards the, the more ethical uses? So you're not worried about kind of um, bad data as such. You, you, I mean, because that's a, another place that I thought you were kind of coming at the fact that you know there is much bad data all over the place, and people keep reusing the bad data and not you know, even when it's being withdrawn and stuff. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I do. I do worry about that. I think that that's not specific to open source. That's that's specific to, but but it is specific to the laziness slash efficiency, right? And I think that's the thing that, um, you know, sometimes there's this view that I, I find when I say that kind of thing to people is they'll say yes, but isn't it isn't it sort of paternalistic if a, if we're if we're deciding for people what the uses are, and my response is you're actually deciding whether you mean it to or not. It's like constructing a menu at a restaurant. We know the order of things on a menu in a restaurant influences what you order. And so the, the restaurant can structure their menu to make it more likely that you buy profitable things for them, expensive things, healthy things. Now, the rest, what the restaurant can't do is construct a menu that doesn't influence you. That's, that's not one of their options. And it's the same thing when you produce open source software you are influencing how people will use it by the very design of your API. So the question is not, how do I do this in a way that doesn't influence? That's not possible. The question you should ask yourself is, what do we want to influence them to do? And take the influence for granted because you don't have a, you don't have a choice about that. The only way to not influence is to not post. Thank you. Yep. Michelle, I Michael, I, I'm not. I apologize. Yeah. I'm doing my best. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, I have a very short question with a long kind of follow up. So, a short question is: Why do you choose? Because it's kind of philosophically contentious issue. Why do you choose to say that all axiology or science about values is ethics? Ah, uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the reason is because I think that we cannot, so, all right, apologies for those for whom this might get a little in the weeds, but I do not think that we can draw, so a standard issue that gets raised is, um, uh, to this sort of more bigger tent view, is the idea that there's a distinction between moral values, the value of privacy, say, and what we often refer to as the epistemic values, so simplicity. Um, I do not think you can draw a bright line. I don't think that there's actually a distinction between, I, I don't think there's a principled distinction to be drawn between, the, uh, between epistemic and moral values. And so then I'm confronted with a choice. Either it's all say epistemology or it's all ethics, right? Now I'm actually okay saying it's all both, right? So I think that when people are making what they think of as moral decisions, I think there's a very large component of things having to do with more, what are sometimes more traditionally classified as epistemic values. But my response to what I think are very compelling arguments that you cannot, you can't draw a distinction between them in the ways that we have traditionally thought we could, my response to it is to say, okay, let's go big 10 and say, I'm not, you know, if you wanna say it's simplicity versus security, like I wanna be able to say that that's, that's a, a trade-off that we engage in, especially in things having to do with AI. Um, you know, we are frequently trying to trade off what seem to be epistemic values against moral values. In fact, I've got a, a whole paper about epistemic ethical trade-offs. And I think that we can coherently think about those. And I think what that tells us is that these are, th there's, a, there's a set, there's a giant collection of values. And the best term I can think of for how do we navigate the conflicts, trade-offs, and interactions between this big collection of values that I have, ethics to me is the best term for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, and how do you propose to document like source of values? Because uh, of course source betrays bias usually in choosing values and it, it helps for those that use the values to know whether it was a purely pragmatic or epistemic choice or it was a moral choice for the higher good, for example. 
Um, so I'm 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 gonna just <laughs> maybe it's that this this is running long. I'm just gonna say I don't know yet. Um, the challenge of developing these kinds of practices that can be a part of that can be ubiquitous, the sorts of things that are just part of everything we do. It, it's literally a, a, an ongoing research effort. It is one of those things that we we have we we know a lot more than people think. Like sometimes people think, oh, we don't know anything about how to have ethics in our everyday decisions of AI development. To use the one that I'm most familiar with, um, we actually know a lot, uh, and and it isn't necessarily the case that people have translated that into their own practices. But we know a lot. But there's still a lot we don't know. Um, and and you're pointing at one of the really key ones is. I, if I can articulate my values, why should somebody else share my values? Well, in part, we think it's because I can point to the reasons why I say those values matter. And you go, oh, those reasons matter to me too. But we don't have um, good practices or structures for representing and conveying those kinds of reasons for values that influence decision. We can do one step of, the, of, the, of that chain, but not the second. And I think you raise a great question and hopefully I can give an answer, a different answer in a year or two. Okay, looking a, forward to it. Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, and, and thank you for that answer. I think that's a really good point to end on. Um, I think, you know, I hope Topos can be a part of exploring these sorts of questions too. So uh, please join me in thanking uh, David once more and then we'll transition to off the record discussion. Thanks. So I, I noticed some questions. Let me just really quickly, just in case people are still on, let me just ping mm -hmm. very quickly a couple of things in the chat. So the first is, uh, Frank, I, I saw you, you raised Kate Crawford's Atlas. Yeah, Kate, I mean, she's one of the, she, she's one of the, the, the 